such a pinch, Dennis. I'll give you such a pinch, he says, his eyes alight with love and playfulness, their corners creased with genuine joy. The exuberance expressed comforts like a parent and delights like your best friend. He is a brother, a son, a friend, and an uncle, but he's so much more. He's a troublemaker, a jokester, a prankster, and a storyteller, but he's so much more. You're in a dirty parking lot near Yankee Stadium. He's talking to a stranger, hyper-aware of his surroundings, but not afraid. After some bickering, tickets materialize where once there was cash. You enter the mythical building, the mecca of leather, pine tar, wood, and pinstripes. Your eyes fall upon the souvenirs, and within minutes your head is adorned with a collector's edition stadium hat, perhaps a little too large. You see the players far below, ants on the diamond. A lost soul in front of you wears the symbol of the enemy, red socks from that dreaded city of Boston. The absorbency of these socks is soon tested as it appears to rain beer on the man's head. Between innings, you're taken down the stairs and around the field. He's talking to a man in an usher's uniform. Cash is quietly pressed into the man's hand, and you find yourself sitting 15 seats behind home plate. It's the bottom of the ninth, and your team is losing. You ask to leave in disappointment. It's not over till it's over, he says, as Don Mattingly's bat rockets the ball into the outfield. The scoring runs, instigating a raucous cacophony of applause. See, he says, smirking with pleasure. You're at a batting cage, patiently awaiting your turn to bat while the weight of the quarters in your pocket seems to expand along with the eternity of the weight. The boys in front of you appear to have an endless turn as their father feeds the voracious machine coin after coin, ignoring your very existence. Returning from his turn at the fast pitch cage, he asks how you're doing expectantly. Surprise gives way to frustration and anger upon learning you've yet to swing the lumber. He asks the father of the boys why. A snide retort about coins and the man finds himself airborne, flying as gracefully as a one-winged bird. The man is in tears as he begs for his children's help. You finally take your turn to bat as he explains the purpose of the free flying lessons to the security guard. You stand on the side of the road near the abandoned quarry, a rifle slung over his shoulder. As the daylight surrenders to dusk and to blackness, the burn song dissolves into the sounds and smells of a Vermont winter night. The temperature approaching painful frigidity, he is there, marching in place in the thigh-deep snow, smoke rising from the burning cherry in his mouth. The crackling sounds and in his inhalation are barely audible above the rhythm of the footsteps in the snow, and the approaching chorus of wild canines beyond the tree line. You want one? he asks, his smile seemingly reaching from one roguish eye to the other as you complete your hundredth jumping jack. You hear the predators of the night nearby, and you see the concern on his face, despite the guise of humor he wears to keep you at ease. But you know he will protect you. Finally, headlights breach the darkness. You perch in a canoe adrift in the water, fishing gear temporarily forgotten as he strains to fill the chamber with a few more pumps. He lowers the barrel to the water, aiming it along the surface toward the vessel of our unsuspecting companions. His visage gleams of mischief as he pulls the trigger, the pellet skipping across the glassy water until colliding with a deafening clap upon the metal boat. Our companions nearly capsize, profane exclamations emanating from their shock, while he rolls with laughter and hurls a few insults for good measure. There were no fish for dinner that night, but no one noticed, for the laughter satiated our appetites. You're in a hotel fitness center together. Clueless as to the point or purpose of these machines, he hands you a pair of dumbbells and shrugs his own. These are the muscles that the girls like, he says, intently watching his straining reflection in the mirror. Together you move among the equipment in the room, sharing moments of sweat and strain, of laughter and embarrassment. You're of small frame, and while physically strong, he knows that you lack in confidence. He teaches you to move the iron, to put in the work, to pull the weight, and to lift yourself up. Of the numerous gifts he's graced you with, this lesson will paint the path of your future as you use the pain of the resistance to help relieve the pain that life deals you. It's late, and you've both worked a full day. The lead paint chips litter the floor and the halogen light. A smell of burning permeates the room, so you look to see him standing by the lamp, sprinkling on more multicolored flakes. He wears the smile of Anansi, the grin so ingrained in your soul you can't help but encourage it. He inhales deeply of the vapors. Now maybe we can at least enjoy working late. A new entry to his resume. Father. Despite the exhaustion, you've never seen his eyes quite so bright. He wears his heart on his sleeve. The pride and determination he displays are familiar, but originate from another, deeper place. 
His love has reached a new dimension. You found yourself a new home, the fifth country in which you've tried to make a life with your growing family. He tells you that they'll be in London. The Yankees will play the Red Sox. As the plane touches down, the thought of catching up, sharing the same space is sensational. His smile is the same as ever. Authenticity and chicanery in equal measures, now accompanied by crow's feet from decades of laughter and shenanigans. It's as though no time has passed except in both of your countenances. You're at a little league game. His pride and joy is on the mound, having a rough go of it. He tells the young pitcher to get it together. You tell the youngster how to keep his cool. He tells the boy to listen, that despite any differences you have, you have lived more life than most people ever will. Your opinion should be heard, even when you're wrong, he adds, that familiar squint in his eyes. You find yourself struggling not only to provide but to excel. You never stop working and struggle to make time for those you love. You exchange messages, you make snide remarks online about haircuts and everyday life. You see his pride grow from a distance. He sends you a concert posting, the Dropkick Murphys. You tell him you want to go, but are unsure of your work schedule. You send him birthday wishes, tell him you love him. He loves you too, but you've always known that. His love, often expressed with an insult or a joke, sometimes misunderstood by others, often hidden behind frustrations, stubbornness, and arguments. His love felt so deeply that expression was elusive. The reality is, he may have loved more deeply and more genuinely than anyone else. He's a brother, a son, a friend, an uncle, and a father. He is so much more. What I wouldn't give to give him such a pinch and feel his love one last time. With all my love forever and always, Ryan Bodenstein.